that's amazing. You can make a start. Go for it. Anna, we can't hear you. I think it's because you're muted, Anna. You'll have to unmute. Yes. God bless you. Yeah. Now you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, can hear you, can see the I'm slideshow. Sorry. That's all right. Okay, sorry. That's all right, please. Uh, okay. Don't apologize. Um, yeah. So it's a term baby. It was a vaginal birth. It, it, it was no risk factors, but the, meconium, the um, amniotic fluid was stained with meconium and the mother was with fever and a high CRP. The GBS was negative and the baby born well, didn't need any uh, reanimation measures, but uh, he started with the respiratory distress, grunting and polypnea and needing oxygen. He was connected to high flow, uh, eight liters per minute, and the FiO2 was too high. It was up to 70%. Um, the clinic was not so bad, but the, the uh, sets were not going up. And um, it was um, the first uh, blood test came with the ICRP and it started on antibiotics. So I was on there on the day he was born. So these are done after admission in the, in the NICU in the first two hours of life. And we can see that there is lung sliding in the right lung. And the pleural line is thick and irregular. And my doubt is if there are some uh, consolidations um, subpleural because of these tiny white uh, dots. And in some places, it seems like there is a tiny consolidation subpleural here. And um, I was here. I, yep. I had that thought. Um, uh, so I think uh, when I look at it, yes, you've got the bat wing. You've definitely got pleural sliding with irregular pleura. I think the challenge in my mind is you, you've, like when I look at R1 and R2, you've, you've definitely got compact B lines coming in there. And there are some small subpleural consolidations that are visible. Uh, in R2, some of those kind of consolidations might be comet tails. Uh, but definitely in R1, uh, I would agree. They look like subtotal consolidations, uh, especially where you have the compact B lines. Yep. Yes, uh, the, as well that. as that isolated small consolidation in R2, where you see the pleura falls away. Now, the question is whether that's just a little bit of microatelectasis or whether that might be a small consolidation. I, I think you yes. could rate it as either, but I would agree with you. Yes. Yep. And um, the left lung was the same with compact bead lines and this irregular pleural line. And some places it seems yep, like- Absolutely no doubt. Absolutely no doubt. When you look at L3 posteriorly, now you have subtural it's, consolidations. Yes. Yep. This Abs was at the posterior axillary line. Yep. Uh, the baby was supine. Yes. So. The X-ray was not typical from meconium aspiration. Completely agree. So I was in doubt if you could uh, classify the ultrasound like that or not. Um, uh, it's the first ultrasound. What's the age of the baby? Uh, it was after admission in the NICU in the first yeah. uh, two hours. So for me, uh, what I'd say is at the moment, when I just look at the lung ultrasound, I, I have no evidence of patchy widespread consolidation. I've got more of a uniform kind of an appearance with what is dominant B profile with pleura that is thick, a little bit blurred and irregular with definite evidence of subtotal consolidation. So I'd be edging myself towards RDS. Clearly this is the kind of baby who you would want to do serial lung ultrasound on. But looking at this clinical picture, I'd be thinking more of respiratory distress at this particular point. The points against transient tachypnea at the moment is I have subplural consolidations, which are definitely visible, uh, which go against it. 
I think the second aspect, uh, kind of the diagnosis of TTR, I certainly don't have any double lung points that are clearly visible. There is some areas of aeration of the lung, like if you look at R2, but that could be there with RDS. And we know the anterior part of the lung tends to aerate before, uh, and in particular, you know, the right side with the bronchus being slightly more straight. So I'm just hinging my thoughts at the moment. And when I think of a mental model, having gone through all of them, RDS would be kind of top of my list at the moment, but I'd keep an open mind. And what I'd want to do is follow the clinical course. So let's have a think about the clinical course. Have you repeated? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so on the second day of life, the, the, the baby was stable and the FIO2 came down quickly. In the first uh, 12 hours, the FIO2 came down to 30% and then 21%. But on the third day, he was again worsening with more uh, uh, needs of FiO2 and polypnea. And the, the PCO2 rise also, and the CRP rise to 22. Yep. I was not there, but in the day of life four, um, I did the lung ultrasound. I, I don't know why this is here, these uh, measures. I don't remember to do it. Uh, don't worry. I don't know. Don't worry. It's okay. So... On the right lung is better. The yeah. pattern is better Absolutely. with more A lines yeah. and less uh, B confluent B lines. They are more sparse B lines. And um, I think sometimes we can think there is a, a small subpleural consolidation, but um, not so well visible, like in the last scan. Yep. And we have here a small pleural effusion, yep. I guess. Yep. I would agree. To... Yep. Nothing to add to that. My only comment is your gain settings. Uh, yes. So at the moment, the images look nice and bright. Have you tried just reducing your gain settings just a bit? I, try, I tried, but it was worse. So it was worse. I, no problem. That's that. fine. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. You have a lovely R3. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, so decent. Uh, would you like to describe R3 for us? Well, we have the the bad sign and yep. the plural line that is uh, sliding well. And uh, I think it's regular here with predominance of A lines. Yeah. And here are some B lines that are sparse that come yep. down. And... Um, I think here we don't have a plural effusion only yep. on R2. Yep, I agree. So Carry on. The, yep. the baby, although the baby gets worse, uh, on this day he was uh, getting better again. So we didn't know what was happening there in that day. And the left side is. Uh, improving also yep yep okay yep. and this was the x-ray of that day yep. it was a, a nice x-ray but yesterday i was on service and um, they asked me to repeat the ultrasound because the crp was not coming down so quickly as the clinic of the baby it was on room hair but the crp was not coming down so the doubt was there if it could be some consolidation of some pneumonia and uh, I, I did the ultrasound and my surprise was that the pleural effusion is big is on in all the anterior sides of the lung mm. I don't know it's small but yeah I was in doubt if this has any significance or not we can talk about it, but how is your baby clinically? Is your baby clinically in room okay. air, comfortable, full feeds, yes. and yes. respiratory distress minimal to mild? Yes, yeah. he's like that. Yep. Yes, lovely. He's, he's improving, he's better. Um, so I didn't know what to do with this. Uh, I think nothing. Absolutely right answer. So... Uh, we these are the right sided images. Yep. Yes. Yes, but we have on the left side also. Yep. We have a plural effusion in both lungs.
again we'll let it and it's yeah on ant anterior parts of the lung that there is the the signs of the pleural yeah. infusion it's very minimal very 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 minimal was your baby nurse prone by any chance at the stage um, I, I don't know. Yesterday, when I did the scan, he was on uh, supine for a long time. Okay. When I did it. Sure. I mean, it's very minimal to the point where in L2, I can barely see it. And in L1, you have a REM. So uh, I think I wouldn't be too worried about it. We'll, we'll talk about it. I'm just keen to get the group in. So uh, I was going to ask uh, Naz. Naz, would you like to, what's your clinical feel on this baby? You're thinking of a diagnostic kind of approach. We're just going to mental model. So um, the initial scans, the first ones, which Anna showed, um, looked more like RDS kind of picture with um, good pleural sliding, uh, mainly a B profile. And, um, and if you scope, did a BRAT score, I guess it would come... Two, two on each of the, um, yeah, on the right side, left side, and on the axilla. So it would go, and I, I don't think um, surfactant was given, but it would possibly clinically, and I guess on the ultrasound fit a criteria to think about giving surfactant as well. Um, the baby then um, deteriorated, and then, uh, uh, on the um, and then. Im and then slowly improved as well. Um, so we're just thinking about the diagnostic kind of approach. So I'm just thinking of those four or five diagnoses. So we've got RDS, TTN, RDS, TTN, sepsis, pneumonia, um, yeah. and a pneumothorax. And meconium aspiration potentially. Meconium so, aspiration. Yeah. 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 So and when we, yeah, go for it. I won't interrupt you. Yeah. No, no, go on. We think something, sorry. No, 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 no. I was just saying that, it, like, we justify the kind of approach in the situation, uh, points in favor, points against. So let, take each diagnosis one by one. So if we think this is meconium, do we think this is meconium? No, because um, it doesn't have... Um, It, it doesn't so, have the the plural um it doesn't have the atelectasis um kind of picture very good so for the diagnosis of meconium aspiration bilateral lung involvement with predominantly patchy consolidation evidence of atelectasis a b profile in the non consolidated areas uh with or without a plural effusion uh i mean for me this is very uniform uh, it's it's a course that is quite long. It doesn't give me the, the, the definition I need for meconium aspiration. What about pneumonia? So again, for pneumonia, it doesn't show the any areas of um, consolidation or atelectasis as well. So it doesn't fit diagnosis of pneumonia. Yeah. No shred sign, uh, no lower mm -hmm. consolidations. So... Absolutely right. It doesn't fit the diagnosis of an ammonia. What about that CRP? The CRP is high. Um, and mum did have fever uh, at that at the time of delivery as well. So there still could be sepsis and GBS. Um, okay, so fair point. So that's one of our differentials at the moment. So we could still have sepsis, maybe not severe enough to cause a pneumonitis. Uh, okay. And let's talk about a pneumothorax. We're relatively happy that we don't have evidence of a pneumothorax in any of these images. Good sliding everywhere. Dominant B profile. Yeah, I couldn't see any pneumothorax. Um, there's good pleural sliding. I mean, um, there isn't any M mode which would help as well, but uh, on these images, it doesn't look as if there is any pneumothorax. Okay. So that's really helpful. Uh, so the, the I kind of did the yeah. AM mode on the on the heart too, because we had more A lines here. So yeah. I did the M mode here, and it was a short sign. Lovely. 
that's uh, that's beautiful. Now, my question is really the two diagnoses, the, the three diagnoses that I would think of in this situation following the clinical course in the serial ultrasounds. The first would be RDS. You've definitely got subcrural consolidations uh, that have been visible early in the clinical course, uh, less so later on because the baby's recovered. Mild RDS would give you exactly this kind of clinical presentation. If I look at the clinical course this baby's taken for TTN, it's just too long. You know, yeah. for a baby to take such a long time to recover. Uh, now, I would just be wary. And again, with clinical correlation, CRPs can be elevated for a variety of reasons. This baby might have had a little bit of mild meconium aspiration. You know, not severe enough to cause consolidation. Not severe enough to give you uh, all the features of atelectasis. But uh, maybe mild enough to give you just a B profile. In the studies that were done by J. Liu, you know, they, they looked at 160 odd cases having a profile of mild meconium aspiration presented like this. And there's a very nice case report, which is part of the articles that you've got uh, in your library, which talks about resolution and mild meconium aspiration in the context of six cases. Now, what they found was that actually some of the changes, like where there was consolidation, it took up to four weeks for them to get better. For me, the bit that just doesn't add up for meconium aspiration is this, there's no significant uh, consolidations that, you know, the big and patchy in both lung fields, you can't exclude mild meconium aspiration. But actually, when you look at the treatment for both of these situations, if this is mild RDS with a symptomatic baby, or if this is mild meconium aspiration with that CRP, I think clinically, you're probably still going to treat with antibiotics for five days. I think most of us wouldn't be brave, uh, especially while we're using CRPs. But in terms of diagnostic conundrum, I, I think you're really dealing, in my mind, with an RDS-like clinical picture, maybe mild meconium aspiration. And pleural effusions are well associated with both these conditions, and they take a while to get better. Uh, so don't feel too anxious about the pleural effusion. A, it's minimal. B, uh, actually, from our perspective, if your baby's clinically improving, it's not really something that Experience says that if you thought about a pathological effusion like a chylothorax or uh, say a hemorrhagic pleural effusion, then they'd be much larger. A chylothorax would probably get worse with clinical course as you feed the baby. So I, you know, points against that in my mind are that it's just minimal. It's actually on one side. So my overall feeling is you're probably dealing with either respiratory distress syndrome in a baby who's taking his time to get better uh, may have met criteria for Lisa. It doesn't bother me. I, I tend not to Lisa big babies in my clinical practice. I just, some of them will smolder for longer, but uh, they do need a good degree of sedation. And, you know, it's really debatable how much you're going to treat term RDS. I think, uh, you know, the the trial that's being done in the UK and uh, Australia serves up will give us a little bit more information about that. Uh, any other comments from anybody else? I think the images I are good. Yeah. I think, look, we would have probably not seen the pleural effusion if we hadn't done the lung ultrasound. Um, yep. And we, we'd be just ignorant about it just because we're seeing it on the lung ultrasound. Yes. But it's probably not that significant, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Uh, really good question from Suman. Uh, you know, in this day and age, we have a lot of COVID going around. Uh, and some babies can be affected by COVID. Uh, interestingly, the majority of the babies who I've seen affected with COVID have not had respiratory symptoms. The majority of them have kind of had poor feeding lethargy or have come in postnatally with a little bit of dehydration. But I'm just curious, what's the group's experience? What have the presentation of babies in your units been like? Have you had many respiratory presentations of COVID? Uh, uh, can I come in? Please, please, Dr. Suman, please, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, we had one COVID case uh, just recently. Uh, for, in this season, this is the first one we had. Um, but this baby stayed for a little bit long time in the unit and um, my mother was symptomatic and this baby turned out to be COVID positive. And he had uh, respiratory symptoms, okay. including cough also. Okay. Um, but uh, baby did well, did not require much support. We didn't give any an antibiotics. X-rays were normal. CRP was, uh, I think, mildly raised. Sure. And now baby has recovered. So this is the baby we have uh, uh, right now. And this is the first baby in this season. Okay, that's amazing. 
That's amazing. That's really. Look, can I ask if the mother yes. was vaccinated or not? For the kids. Ma mother? Yeah. Did the mother receive vaccines? Yes, yes, mother received. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from anybody else? It's a it's a lovely case to discuss. Yeah, it's a beautiful case. And again, just the sensitivity of lung ultrasound and being able to pick up pathology like a pleural effusion, which you clearly can't see very well on the, the chest x-rays. So well also, done, Anna. Yeah. Because it is having atypical features. I mean, it's not fitting into classical uh, uh, diagnosis. So uh, that, therefore, I thought maybe COVID can present in any yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a very fair point. And, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, if you have, symptoms in the mother, then testing for it would be very important. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. I, yeah, please. Tell you, I, I did the mode to see if I picked up the sinusoid sign, but maybe it's because it's small. little, it's very you small. can see it. Okay. I mean, the question is whether your M mode would even hit it because you might just be at the plural line. So it's so small that often you won't get a sinusoidal sign in such small so, plural effusions. I thought that if we can't pick it, maybe it's because it's too small, so we yeah. don't have to worry about the pleural effusion. Am I right? Yes, that would be my okay. approach. Yeah. I think okay. if the baby ever became symptomatic again with respiratory distress, you'd repeat. But if the baby's clinically better and symptoms are improving. Now is good. Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Yes, now is good. And these were, were the, the posterior um, scans from yesterday that. Uh, we're okay. Yeah. Very nice. Good depth. And I just turned him. It was in the moment. So, and no signs of pleural effusion in the back. So. Amazing. I thought it was a good, uh, a good thing for, uh, for me to not be so worried about the baby. And uh, this is, was just to show you the, um, this double lung point that I picked up yesterday also in a baby. Yep. Very nice. So very good depth. Uh, lovely bat sign. I mean, you've got a beautiful machine. The plura is so well delineated. You're kind com completely uh, perpendicular. Uh, you can see good plural sliding. And I mean, this is a beautiful double lung point. The baby was in room air and was uh, fine. Excellent. So I have a question here. Yeah. Um, here, the position of A lines and B lines uh, seem to be reversed in, in, than in the classical when we see double lung point. In the lower part, there are more B lines than in, than in the upper part. Um, uh, so, can so we still... Yeah, the reason being, if you're looking at... You're, you're assuming that you're looking at R1 and R2. Uh, now, R1 might be fully aerated and R2, and we know that the upper anterior parts of the lungs tend to aerate better. But lower regions of the lung, if you read most studies uh, that have been done and described, there's a very nice paper, again, which is part of the library, which talks about transition of lung. The lower anterior regions of the lung in the supine position tend to aerate later on. So this would not be unusual. This is, in fact, fairly typical of a double lung point and where you'd see it. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Lovely. I then have... Dr. Doris. Thank you. I'll just try and share my slide. Sure, sure. Take your time. Very nice case today. I'm sure everybody is going to. Uh, happy Eid to Shaima, uh, Dr. Hassoon. You can all see my slides, can't you? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's presenter mode. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was um quite an interesting case. Um, so the 28 week uh, who weighed 805 um grams at birth, um, born by emergency section for pathological CTG. Mom had received two doses of steroids and max salt was given. Baby was said to be born in good condition, intubated. So, uh, we can see your desktop, but I can't see your PowerPoint. Oh, you can't. Hold on. Oh. Uh, you might have shared the, the other screen. 
Let me stop sharing. Yep, no problems. Can you see my, can you yep. see it now? Now we can see it, beautiful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this was a 28 week, uh, born in good condition, following emergency section, logical CTG, um, intubated, giving Kyrosef, and actually did quite well. I was extubated by day two of life. I was stable on CPAP. Um, however, by day 19 of life, he was reintubated because of rising FIO2, increased work of breathing, apneas and desaturations, and he was screened and started on antibiotics and treated for sepsis. And so this was a by day 19 of life. So he had, this was the X, chest X-ray done at that point after he was intubated, as you can see, um, what his lung fields look like. The abdomen looked quite um, diffuse, um, bowel gas pattern, um, but there was really nothing convincing in his abdomen to um, be concerning, but he was actually reported to be quite unwell. So he had um, an ultrasound at that point on day 19 when he was reintubated, and I did a follow-up scan um, after 24 hours to review how he was. So I, I will show both scans. So on day 19, um, the first scan, as you can see, um, you can appreciate the plural looks thick and irregular. There is plural sliding and you have um, confluent um, B lines. So it looks like the AIS pattern and mainly a B profile from what I can say. I couldn't see any A, a lines. Um, I yeah, so R2, um, typically the same you can, with the liver coming into view, but you can see, appreciate how irregular the plural line looks. There is plural sliding and also um, typical B profile, as you can see with com um, confluent B lines. Um, R3, so in R3, you can appreciate how irregular the plural looks yep. also. There plural sliding but you can also see so plural consolidations and i wonder if i can describe that as tissue sign with static air bronchograms um still typical b profile confluent b line i can see just um one to one less than one a line but it's typically b profile yeah and i i would probably say you've got subplural consolidations Definitely, uh, I it would be difficult in the light lateral upper to kind of comment on a tissue profile, but definite lung sliding, uh, AIS pattern with subplural consolidations, absolutely no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Okay. And very nice images, Doris. So the the good thing is even with a depth of five centimeters, I'm getting a really good delineation of the bat sign the plural margin, subplural consolidations, and you know what is an AIS pattern. I'm getting the the, the lung all the way through. That's really good. I mean, uh, from the, the previous images, uh, you've obviously made some changes here that look really good. Yeah. Okay. And um, still the same right um, lateral um, view, um, just interrogating that area. As, I mean, it's the same. I was a bit concerned. You can see the plural consolidations, plural sliding. And then there's this... Um, hyperechoic um, region that keeps coming in. I was wondering whether that was a consolidation. I, it's in the right upper area, so lateral area. So I didn't think that could not be the liver, but I don't know. I think it's artifact. I think so. what I'd say is, like I said, the plura has to be irregular for a deep consolidation extend all the way through. And what, what you're having at the moment is you've got, uh, you're using your hockey stick right? Yeah. 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 So you, you've probably got a little bit less gel here, which is why you're either kind of having an issue with contact in the deeper area. And the other, only other thought is like, if you look at the rib margins here, the intercostal spaces, you've got them really well defined. Whereas over here, it's a little bit more difficult to delineate uh, the bat sign. So I think you're probably getting a lot of bone, which is giving you a big acoustic shadow. And when you kind of the probe moves with the sliding, you probably get an element of lung that's coming in there. 
So it just needs a little bit of movement of the probe, a little bit more gel if that's less. Sometimes what happens is you've gelled, you've got good gel in the top half and you slide down. Did you slide down? Or did you take the probe off and place it down? Um, took the probe off. Okay, that should be fairly okay then. I, I think that's artifact. The If it was on the left, I'd be thinking, is that the heart coming in? But it's on the right. Yeah. So, But I think that's artifact. But what is clearly visible is the, the subplural consolidations. And it looks a lot worse as you move from the anterior to the lateral zones, uh, R3 and R4. Yep. Not convinced about a tissue sign anywhere at the moment. Yep. All right, and on the and on the left, on the left side, um, you can appreciate the same profile. Um, so pleural consolidations are irregular. The pleural is um compact confluent B lines. So typically a B profile. Um, beautiful, yeah, uh, beautiful. Same on the left lower area. Yep. Uh, so this is also the same, but in this view. Um, the left lateral area still Ooh. the same, and then but and then yep. I was wondering what this yep. was whether that this were static air bronchograms. Um, I didn't yep. think it hot. So. It could be static air bronchograms. My only advice would be, when you have the probe there, you have an area. You remember we talked about the region of interest. So yes. what I do is I would slide the probe down to get that entire area, that region of interest. Uh, maybe just zoom in a little bit to that area, but I would agree to you that it just looks like there's an element here of a significant consolidation with static air bronchograms below that. And uh, that it's very suspicious. I think you have a big consolidation, you know, with a, a reasonable deeper element to it. Uh, did you have, you, have you been able to go a little bit lower down and put Doppler on it? Uh, I'm still struggling to make the Doppler work. When I put it on, it's a little speckling, so I wasn't sure I could I could really trust. Um, I've not gotten that Doppler bit right yet, so I'm still Good. working on it. No problems. I and mean, then, yeah. And then I was also going to say that now, these scans, I confess, I didn't do all of them. So, but the second scan, long ultrasound that follows this, I did all those ones, so I won't No problems. Them. It's okay, don't worry. No worry. This, Totally, because I didn't do all the scans. Yeah, sure. Um. So yeah. So, so after this, so day twenty, I did it. So for just mental model. What do you think is going on before we move on? So, um. So, um. With the clinical presentation in mind, a baby who was well, technically preterm baby, stable on non-invasive ventilation, and then, a, I mean, a change, and this was like within a space of about twelve hours deterioration. And screens and started an antibiotics, nail by mouth, you know, and with the chest x ray find intubated. So my thought was this baby was, was septic. And when I looked at this, I, I looked at this um, first ultrasound um, done and I reviewed them and I did one or two of these scans. I didn't do this one. So I, so I was okay, sure. Don't worry. That's all right. I think uh, I would agree. You know, I'd be very worried with especially that left side. My only question is, did you do the posterior lung regions? The baby was quite the unwell. Monster. Unwell, that's fine. What I'd say is, I think in this situation, they're quite important. And the reason they're quite important is if the baby's been supine, uh, you, you just risk, because my worry when you look at that presentation of the left lower lobe, it's very focal. It's mm -hmm. a focal area of consolidation in relation to a lung which shows AIS with a thick blurred pleura throughout. So evolving chronic lung disease with an area of focal consolidation, uh, static air bronchograms. The question again that we're asking is, could this be a focal mnemonic consolidation? And just if you see something like that, the back is, could you might just potentially have a lot of mnemonic presentation or consolidations on the back region, because if you have exudate, it'll tend to move towards the back. The best thing in that situation would be to do a very quick scan in the posterior axillary line. So you limit it to as small a time as possible. But this is where I would say a comprehensive scan would be quite important. I did that. I managed to do a, um, a, a posterior scan in the posterior axillary line in the subsequent scan. So I did that one. But Let's so have a look at those. Well done. Yeah.
So interestingly, I mean, the CRP was not elevated, white cell count wasn't high, but this baby was clinically unwell. Um, by day 20, FIO2 had gone up to, up to 55%, was having lots of uh, white prolent secretions and needed frequent suctioning with um, chest physio, had been nailed by mouth, and, but because there were no obvious abdominal signs, so there were plans to restart feeds again. Um, so these were my machine settings. I've been working on 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 the settings of my GE machine. So I reduced the depth to four, a gain of 10 and a frequency of seven. And I actually repeated this. The indication for this um, follow-up scan um, was to review the progress to see how the baby was doing. Um, we hadn't done a repeat chest X-ray, so I wanted to see what the long ultrasound would show compared to the previous scan and also mindful that the baby's oxygen requirements were going up. Um, he still remained um, quite unstable, did not tolerate handling. So this was a quick in and out scan. Yep. Um, so at the, when I did this scan, I scanned at the posterior axillary line because he was lying. I could move him a bit to lie on one side, on the right side, so that I could do this scan as yep. quickly as possible. They won't be easy and they won't be straight. So. Trust me. I mean, that looks very, very informative. You've got really good depth up to 3.5 and you've basically got a subplural kind of consolidation with a plural line that's not delineated, which would say to me that there's a combination of consolidation atelectasis in that region. And it's, you know, R5 looks pretty, pretty bad. That yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful image. I know how difficult it is to do R5 and R6 in that situation. So well done. I'm sorry, can I describe this as tissue sign also or not? <laughs> Uh, well, just I'd, so I'd, I'd like to say it's more of a uh, a dense AIS kind of a pattern with subplural consolidation atelectasis, not a tissue sign, no. All right. no. And can I describe this as air bronchograms, dynamic air bronchograms on this? this I don't know. No, no, no. For me, they're subplural. They're, they're static air bronchograms in the middle. So uh, if you take your arrow, yeah, yeah that's a static air bronchogram there. And again, there's some static air bronchograms to your right that become quite dense. So they come, they, they basically appear and disappear. They're in the same position. It's not like a snake moving in and out. So for me, yeah. you, you have some static air bronchograms in the middle. Uh, maybe on the left side as well that are coming up. But really what you can clearly see is this kind of slightly moth-eaten appearance below the pleura with a plural line that's quite blurred. So... Overall, that's that's consolidation with a little bit of atelectasis, and there are some static air bronchograms there. But I wouldn't say dynamic air bronchograms, and I, I wouldn't be saying tissue sign just yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then R6, um, I, would say, I would say the same, a bit of um, loss of contact. I think it was the gel, because I had to apply the gel again. Yeah. But you can appreciate how irregular yeah. the plural line looks. There is plural start sliding with um, consulate B lines. Um, I saw this irregularity and I was wondering whether yes, has the consolidation or whether I would describe this as the shred sign because they will say this oh, it's consolidation. For me, it's consolidation. All right. Yeah, it's not irregular enough uh, to kind of give a fractal appearance. Okay. Uh, and some of the shadowing might be because you have a rib there, which, but for me, that's a consolidation. Yeah. Okay. And then, so Ooh, okay, R1, well, yes, my man moved the little boy again um, to R1, and I just picked this up and yep. uh, so I zoned in on it, focused yep. on that, that clearly, and to, to explain what that was. So you can see there is a break in the plural, and there is plural sliding, it's irregular, and there is subplural consolidations. And but this area. Yep. Static air bronchograms, I, because I was so... Yep, static air bronchograms at the bottom. But again, now you have... So can you see how the plural margin doesn't get yeah. established right to the top? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you're not establishing... There's no aeration. There's aeration that is there at the bottom, which is giving you that appearance of... Like when you look at R1, the static air bronchogram appears and disappears with inspiration, expiration. And you have yeah. a predominantly AIS kind of pattern below that. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Again, what I'd say is you've got a very large area of subplural consolidation with atelectasis, but now you have very irregular margins. Uh, the point against a mnemonic consolidation 
with a fractal sign is usually with a fractal sign, you should be able to see the plural margin at the top. I cannot see a plural margin, maybe just a little bit of variation, which comes in and out. So for me, mm. this is, again, it's a collapse consolidation as opposed to a fractal sign. But again, I'd be putting Dopplers on this and seeing. Uh, and I mean, absolutely no doubt, you know, even with this presentation, I think you'd be very brave not to be on antibiotics. No, oh, very well, Dante, this is on yeah. antibiotics. Yeah. It's an antibiotic. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a focal area of consolidation. And again, that's why uh, complete lung interrogation in this situation is very, very important. It's a beautiful image. I just love the way you've got uh, your anatomy up to four. And again, it's just an example of the benefits of sometimes using a lower frequency to get that depth. And there's no harm, uh, Doris, in just putting your frequency up just because you're losing a low frequency, uh, you're using a GE, right? Yes. Yeah. So the GE doesn't necessarily need, uh, is your the GE95? What, which machine? The X5? <laughs> don't look, I don't know. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Okay. So it doesn't use focus. It basically gives you the uh, delineation and improves uh, kind of focus at every area. But just... Be careful if you're using a low frequency because you're not focusing on the plural line. Uh, you might sometimes have dropout because of that. So no harm in just putting the frequency up just to see the plural line and then dropping it to see the depth. But okay. yeah, that's a large area of consolidation with that lectesis plural margin not established with static air bronchograms. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. And so L1. Um, as you can see, so uh, because of positioning and with handling, I couldn't do the 12 um, um, views. So I could no just problems. do No problem. No Absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think about L1? Sorry. Yeah, so L1, uh, I, the plural margin looks um, was very irregular, so plural consolidations. There is sliding, and you certainly have a compact B, um, B lines now. Yeah, this, I agree. Um, I thought this was shred sign, or is it just subplural consolidation? No, it's subplural consolidation. It's so it's more a of a subplural consolidation. Yeah, that break might you've got a rib there again, and sometimes when your probe is not horizontal, you get these intermittent breaks in the plura, and you can just see how. The, the, you're slightly slanted. You have more soft tissue at the upper part of the image than at the lower part of the image. So okay. the, if, if you just reorient your probe, you might actually be able to see the plural line a little bit better. And again, you're using a frequency of seven. So it, you'll be, your focus will be better at the level of you know, the deeper part of the lung. And sometimes that can affect how you interpret the plural as well. But I, I wouldn't call that a shred sign at the moment, no. Okay. Um, I must say that his positioning was very tricky. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I had to just go do it quickly. That's very sensible. And then I tried to focus to see if there was anything else. I think that I need to work on using the Doppler to see if I can um, to interrogate um, consolidation. So this was L2. Um, okay. Uh, which I also found, yep. Yeah, Interesting. I think the the the, the 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 last ultrasound done on day 19, I think it was an L2 that had that area. Yep. Uh, large consolidation. So I tried to focus on that side um, when I did this and so could appreciate the plural, um, the regular plural, the plural sliding, the compact B lines. And then if this was that that area. Yep. So guys, uh, it's this is a beautiful image. I want so all of you have kind of been talking about deep consolidations. Now, can you see why this is a deep consolidation? Probably with a little bit of atelectasis because the plura is established below. So if, if you just take your arrow, Doris, to the right of the screen, go to the plural line. So that, so that area there is the plural margin. And basically then you come to the middle and you can't see plura in between. Okay. And you've got these static air bronchograms there no dynamic yeah. air bronchograms with an area that looks quite dense. Now yeah. that is liver-like. And I think it's just because you've got slightly blurred settings, but that for me is a deep consolidation. And you can see how it, it arises from the plura. Now this is why, this is, this is the difference between, you sometimes get 
a picture like this deeper down, but the pleura is completely intact. Now, by definition, you should not be calling those deeper regions. Like if the pleura was completely intact and you had this appearance, I'd be thinking is this artifact, but the pleura here is definitely affected. I can't see established pleura here, but what is very, very important is, uh, I think you also have a little bit of a lung pulse there with the heart. Yeah. yeah. And that again would favor, I would say, consolidation with a little bit of atelectasis. Yeah. So it's a beautiful, it's a deep consolidation with a little bit of atelectasis, I think with static air bronchograms, pleura is not established just below the rib. And you, you know that is classically how a deep consolidation presents. It's a beautiful image. I would save that as part of your portfolio. Okay. I was a little bit confused because I was wondering why is it separate from the pleura? It's and... just you're not aerating. So what is happening is, what does aeration mean? So everybody kind of thinks aeration means we should see visible A lines. Yeah. But actually, in order for you to see a B profile, you still have to have air coming into the lung. If you have absolutely no air coming into the lung, then really what you'll see is complete atelectasis. But here you've got air, which is coming up to that margin that looks like, just put your arrow over the static air bronchograms. Uh, yep, beautiful. So that's where air is penetrating up till. And basically you're not getting air penetrating beyond that. And for that reason, that's why you're getting, you know, that appearance of the plural line not being established. Okay. So. Again, I've there's a video on pneumonia versus consolidation that I've just released. I'll share it with all of you today if you haven't seen it, but it covers this aspect of how you differentiate consolidation from atelectasis really nicely. And the most important aspect is if you have complete atelectasis, you have no air entry into that particular region, then actually the plural line will not be established. With a superficial mnemonic consolidation, or if you have a shred sign, what you'll find is you'll find the pleura is separated into a superficial and a deep region. And here I, I just cannot see the superficial pleura at all, which is why I think this is more a deep consolidation with atelectasis. Again, this would not be a shred sign. The margins also don't look as irregular. So, but it's a beautiful image. Well done. Definite air bronchograms, static, subtural consolidation, agree. Uh, pleural sliding present, but I just think a little bit of lung pulse that you see there. And that's where you'd actually see the shadow of the heart. Just folks, very, very important other differential. If you're looking at this, if you're the person doing the scan, just be careful, the heart comes in that position and the heart can sometimes give you an appearance like this. But if the heart is giving you this appearance, the pleura should be intact above. So just be aware that the heart can give you a very similar kind of an appearance. And it's always important that you try to confirm this a few times. So I move my probe around a little bit and what I'd be doing is I'd be looking at L3, L4 as well, very closely. So, well done. Um, and yeah, well, that, that was it. I yeah. long and had that. I put my diagnosis as, um, because of putting the clinical picture into view, it was consolidation, respiratory deterioration due to infection. Um, when I compared with the um, day 19 ultrasound, there was... I, I, there appeared to be some improvement. The B lines were the B. I was there was a transition from more confluent B lines to less, and there were some um, views that had A B profile. So I was um, I was encouraged that this long bone ultrasound on day twenty was a little bit better than day twenty nine, like day nineteen, and baby was um, there, there hadn't been any change in the clinical progress. So, but um, sure. Antibiotics. Can... We were just restarting feeds. Well done. That's fantastic. Very nice scan. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would um go and go back and check all those um, videos you posted to look at what shred sign and tissue sign is again. Uh, let's see. Yeah. yeah. Share them with everybody today. Okay. Uh, lovely. We have our next presenter, who on my phone. Sujit is not here today, I think, is he? I can't see that he's here. No, Sujit is not here. And neither is Bijay Lakshmi, actually. Does anybody else have a, a case they'd like to present? Or does anybody have another case they'd like to present? 
have another one. I have go for it. Go for it, Doris. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do one more and then, yep. So very nice cases that we're seeing today. And again, what I'd say is for mnemonic consolidation, the clinical correlation, the clinical course of the baby is very, very important. For me, when I look at the first case that Doris has presented, just making a diagnosis of chronic lung disease, I think would be a little bit difficult. I'd be very, very suspicious that this is mnemonic kind of a clinical presentation. I completely agree. Uh, Dopplers were possible, uh, you know, but clinically correlation, you know, tube ventilation, antibiotics, absolutely. Go for it. We'll see the next case. So uh, I will be doing another. So I'll be doing two forms for you, Doris, today. Oh, sorry. Sorry, what did you say? I'll be doing two two objective OSAL forms for you. So it's a, a, a form per scan. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Both of them uh, are very good. Yeah. I want to share. Um, which one? Well, uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. This is the one. I want to share. So we've seen a mild meconium query RDS. We've seen a mnemonic consolidation. Take your time, Doris. No hurry. But those of you who would like uh, to, like I said, uh, next week we'll be having a look at pleural effusions and uh, how we quantify, but we'll talk about the diagnostic thoracentesis and how you do that using ultrasound. So it will be an interesting session, but again, for any cases that you want to get and share with us, I'm really keen for you to do as many scans as you can. Can you see my slide? I can't slide. see your slide. We can see your desktop. Uh, okay. Let me go back. Can you see my slides yes, now? We can do. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, thank you. I mean, this was another interesting case for me that kept me puzzled, uh, trying to figure out if I was making the right diagnosis. This was a 38 week uh, small for gestational age at birth, born by SVD, um, following some concerns with her CTG. Her abgas were six and eight and eight. And there was, she was noted to have respiratory distress after birth. I mean, there were no risk factors for sepsis, nothing documented. So she was observed on the unit and sent back to her mom on the postnatal ward. However, at 10 hours of life, she was brought back down to, the, to NICU um, because of um, increased work of breathing and described as having back arching. And because of the concerns around birth, um, CTG concerns, her abgas at one minute were not brilliant. Her cord gases were not very good, even though she had gotten better. She was screened and started on antibiotics. And um, they did a long, sorry, they did a chest X-ray, and there were concerns that she may have the right pneumothorax. But when I saw her, because I was on call, her work of breathing was not in keeping with the diagnosis. And so I started on on um, high flow, thirty percent oxygen. Her blood gases were showing metabolic acidosis, and the long ultrasound was done because of worsening respiratory distress, which I honestly could not really explain. So this was her long, her chest X-ray. And the team that saw her um, thought she had a small um, right-sided pneumothorax and expected that she would improve. But I put her on high flute and hoping that there should be some clinical improvement. These were my long ultras, my machine settings. And so I did this x-ray when she developed worsening respiratory acidosis. She was virtually grunting on high flow, seven liters and 30% oxygen. There was, I mean, she was, I was, we're not struggling to oxygenate her. Oxygen required, she was in about 98, 99% oxygen, but her CO2 was slowly rising. So I did this extra, this long ultrasound at this point. Um, so starting with R1, um, I could appreciate, yes, 
um, the plural looks continuous, a little bit ir looks irregular, but continuous. I think this is mainly due to the comet tails. The, um, I could appreciate um, plural sliding um, and mainly a profile because I could see the comet tails and I could see the movement. So I could, I could appreciate that there was plural sliding, but it was a little bit confusing. So I, I did the M mode. And looking at this, I thought long and hard, and it was like this must this is seashore appearance. And because I could see there were some commenters, I could appreciate plural, plural slide. And so I said, okay, this must be the this, this must be a seashore appearance. And I looked at R2. So when I looked at R2. So sure. can we go back to R1? It's a really important lesson. Yep. So some people sometimes get confused between the seashore and the barcode sign. Yeah. Now, what is very important here is uh, that your contact, it you must have good contact with the plural line. And sometimes what you find is that when the baby's moving or breathing, you know, classically what happens is you lose contact. Now, whenever you lose contact, or if you have a lack of gel, what will happen is you will default to having air or uh, a lack of image, which will give you a barcode sign. So what you can classically see is alternating seashore and then something that sometimes looks like a barcode in this image. This is not a true barcode sign. Again, go back to clinically what you can see. And for me, my only comment about this is, and this is really important when you're storing your images, ideally to say that you have sliding accurately, you want to store at least five frames. So a good way of looking at that is it's, it's trying to store about five to six seconds of the frame. So, your frame rate with R1. Now, I don't know if it's the way the machine saves it. Uh, so there are two aspects here that are very, very important for the group to know. That you might be having loops that are visibly five to six frames, but when it saves, it saves maybe two or three. And that is very important medical legally. So just uh, the, the challenge that you'll have with sliding over here, like if you just press on R1. Oh. So it's... I've got comet tails all the way through. Yeah. I've got an A profile. Now, but the plural sliding is it's so slow because your frame rate is so slow that it's just making sliding quite difficult to interpret. Now, because you have comet tails over there and with the eye of faith, I'd probably say that you probably do have sliding because I can see the comet tails move. That yes. that that is a pure giveaway. But really, what you'll need ideally when you save this image for storage and we're going to talk about that today is having a higher frame rate so that you can you can demonstrate sliding without a doubt and how do you do that, how do you do that? so you can on your machine on the ge it will say how many fr the frame rate in cycles per second and really what you need to have that is at about five to six it, it can set to as low as one to two five to six and more than that and really five to six is where you have to be but Sometimes what happens is the challenge is it saves and it saves when you download, it saves at a much lower frame rate. And that's something that I've struggled with, with some of our machines. So you might still do that, but uh, get the image that you've currently stored. When you were looking at the image, was it faster than this? Um, I don't remember actually. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, if this was a ch was challenging for me because I kept wondering, is there pneumothorax? Is there not? Is there not? And I kept doing M modes for all of them. Yeah. All the all the views. I mean, here it, you've got a classical seashore sign, and what you've got is a little bit of artifact in between. Yeah. Yep. I I I don't think that's a long point. Yeah. Yeah. But no, let's no. have a look at R two. Yeah. Okay. All right. So R two, this is R two, and then so I could appreciate um. The plural, I could appreciate the comet tails, um, mainly B profile, sorry, A, A yeah. profile, yeah. A profile, um, this is a B line, I mean, B line clearly, and I was worried about the sliding again, um, but because I could see comet tails, I just had to, I had to say that there was certainly plural sliding with the comet tails, and um, even though I was getting this appearance, but because I could see comet tail, so I, I, did, I had to just agree this was seashore um, appearance. I would, I would agree. I think you're just getting a little bit of artifact because if you look at the way the skin and the pleura move, there's a little bit of loss of contact there. Can you see how with your yeah. probe, 
there's a little bit of loss of contact. And I think it's that region of loss of contact that's giving you this profile, which looks, and this is, it's a really important learning point. I, you know, it's, it's beautiful to see the scan, to be able to describe it to colleagues. Again, if you're confused and you think the baby's moving too much and you're losing contact, a good way is restraint here is very, very important. And for the R2 region, what I do is I'd get the nurse to basically keep the upper arm above so that you can get nice, good contact. And sometimes what that means is you have to keep looking at the probe for contact and actually get somebody else to store your loops. But I can see comet tails there, which would definitely go against, you know, a, a small anterior air collection. Yeah. I mean, I think what was, con baby was, in, I mean, was not moving much. It was the work of breathing. I mean, yeah. there were deep yeah. sessions. Yeah, so I don't know whether it accounts for why, why the movement looks like this. Baby yeah. wasn't fine but it was just deep recessions. Yeah. And so this was R3. Ooh, okay. So, yeah. So with R3, I could clearly see the plural. I could not really see any plural, I mean, any comet tilts. I couldn't see any um, B lines, clear bamboo sign, as we can see. Yeah. I would say that there was no plural sliding, no yeah. so I, I could agree. put M mode on. And I said clearly, this is a barcode sign. Yeah, yeah, you have a barcode sign, uh, and there, there are no comet tails. And yeah, right. again, what I'd say is your frame rate being slightly higher would have been able to help, but that looks very suspicious for a barcode sign. Now, can I just ask, is your baby positioned left down, or is the he so fine? Okay, so you have a small air bubble there. Okay, that's fine. Yep, it's a very small, small air bubble. Yep. And um, R4, um, the same thing. I could see some comet tails, um, um, but no, um, I, was, I just couldn't say that there was clear pleural sliding all the way through um, because I could see some comet tails on the right. So I said, okay, there must be pleural sliding here, but I couldn't really appreciate much on the left. Yeah. So whether you have a lung point at that point, because I can yeah. see the plura move in and out. So I yes. think that's your lung point. Okay. This, uh, so at this you, point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So can you see how it gets blurred? So just move to the right of your screen. Right to the top. So that's the plura moving. And I'm not completely convinced that the plura on the left is moving at all. So I think that's your lung point. And classically, okay. you you know, this looks very much like a barcode sign. Absolutely no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, well done. And then, so for R5, um, I took this with the, the posterior axillary line. And I appreciate, um, yeah, you can see the plural, there's plural sliding. You can see some A lines and uh, you can certainly see B and comet tails and B lines. And I could appreciate um, the seashore sign yeah. here. Yeah. That's all. Absolutely. And with some lung, yeah, very good, yeah. Again, some areas that sometimes resemble a barcode more because of loss of contact, but dominantly a seashore sign. This is R6, yep. I think that's what really worried me because yeah. it was, I mean, the changes, I, so it was more because of loss of contact, but because I could see comet tails, then I could clearly say, no, they can't be um, a pneumothorax because yeah. of those confusing um, um, pictures because of the comet tails. Um, so R6, um, yep. as you can see, yep. Um, the plural line, there is sliding. I can see um, yep. comet tails and some B lines, but there is no plural sliding towards the right yep. of the screen, from what I can see. And it's a dominant A profile. So I put the um, the M mode on around that point. And this is a barcode sign around this point. Do you agree? Hello? It's, yeah, it's a little bit tricky. I'm just having a think while looking at the image. It does look like a barcode sign, but again, you've got a seashore on both sides. And again, right. it's really the, the question from my perspective is it's not quite straight. You'd have to be doing the scan. I mean, yourself to kind of correlate. Yeah. My, yeah. my only worry is that your baby is supine. It would be very unusual. Was your baby prone at this point? Or uh, you... no, I, didn't. I put this one, she was lying lateral, so I could do 
So if she, even if yeah. she's lying lateral, then your R3, R4 would definitely have air. You might have an air bubble at R6 as well. It's possible, depending okay. on, like, if she's, so it, it is possible. It's definitely possible. Yeah, I mean, I moved her. I started supine. Then when I went, I tried to do the R5 and 6, and I toned her and, and scanned her the posterior auxiliary line because I couldn't um, yeah. totally turn her over. I'd say R, R3, R4, definitely very convincing. But for the other regions, you know, again, a very important learning point is it's the contact and keeping the contact. And with breathing, it might be difficult because of recession, you lose the contact yeah. and you get that kind of sign. So, but very good clinical correlation, Doris. My compliments. Yeah. Um, I think I have a long point here. I think it's my long point. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so I went to L1. And uh, you can clearly see L1, the pleura is more thin, regular, smooth. You can see comet tails, there is pleural sliding. You can see um, mainly an A profile, but you can clearly see um, the seashore. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. No doubt about it. Good for me to be able to compare that. And same with, uh, with L2, A profile, comet tails, pleural sliding, regular pleura. And same with, so I think it's supposed to be L3, sorry. Yeah. I think that's yep. yeah. And yep. same L4 and 5. And I moved the baby to, essentially the left, um, the left lung, there was clear pleural sliding. Um, as we can see, A profile all the way through A lines, clear bamboo signs, um, seeing few B lines. Yep. And so it, this was actually, Quite an interesting case, and but even at this point, after the long before the long ultrasound, this baby had developed respiratory acidosis with a marked recession, and I just couldn't say that the pneumothorax was that extensive no. to cause the clinical picture. So I just intubated the baby, and upon intubation, after a few hours, the work of breathing improved. I was able to win the oxygen, and she was extubated. Um, about 12 hours after her blood gases improved and so I, it was a very puzzling case because the pneumothorax did not seem that, that did um, you do an echo i mean just pulmonary pressures and gradient yes yeah. so we got an echo um because then i started worrying that there must have been the cardiac element to it maybe the pulmonary pressures but they were fine she was we never struggled to start with oxygenation as soon as she was in on in high flow. She was saturating 98, 99%. As soon as I intubated her, she was 100%. So oxygenation was never an issue. CO2 clearance started getting worse with the worsening respiratory distress. So we had thought maybe there's some other cardiac, whether she had vascular rings. I just couldn't explain why she was worse. And as No soon strider. As... She had no strider. No, it wasn't um, a difficult intubation. No, it's very slick. I intubated her myself. Um, sure, she had sure. this tracheal tug. So I, I was thinking, is there an upper respiratory tract infection? I'm sorry, upper upper uh, airway obstruction. Um, there's a difference between strido and grunting. She was clearly in distress. And I honestly cannot explain up to, to I don't know, but she got better with intubation and all the blood gases improved. And so the pneumothorax is clearly not that extensive to have caused. No, wouldn't explain the work of breathing and yeah. the CO2 yeah. rise. And I mean, no thick secretions at tubing, no, I, nothing uh, like that. Her airway was so clear. Her vocal cords were just, I mean, brilliant. I just could not explain. So I thought this was an interesting case to share and to hear what people thought. So um, whether I picked it up right, uh, whether the pneumothorax was not as um, was not what I thought. But, um, so yeah, so I wanted to share this. Yeah. Sure. Any comments from the group, guys? Anything? I think my only comment is some babies won't read the book. And uh, again, it, the beauty of kind of doing a lung ultrasound to kind of supplement is, I think we can clearly see, I, I'm not convinced we have a large pneumothorax there, possibly, you know, a bubble in a particular focal region, which wouldn't explain things. And that's reassuring. I mean, it helps complement your x-ray. I, I I think the baby's better off to the tube and is improved. Yeah, not better on intubation. I didn't even have to give Curacef because the baby was not needing a lot of oxygen. And yeah, it was a puzzle. But it was good to be able to do the lung ultrasound. And, and sometimes we, we do chest x-rays and we do lung ultrasound, so we don't get quite an answer that we need. 
and yeah. some babies will get better with time and yeah it's kind of one of those ones where you sometimes don't get a diagnosis and that is that's important as well because you know what you're trying to make sure is that you don't have an alternative that explains that it can make you think about cardiac airway if you feel the lungs are completely normal so very good clinical correlation so thank you so much i'm going to start my talk which shouldn't take too long today i think you know it's going to be about half an hour but it's a very important one so i'm just going to share my screen can you see my presentation yes yes full screen not yet no full screen yes okay excellent so what i'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, kind of your training in lung ultrasound and how you're going to implement this going forwards because i'd say about two and a half months from now what will happen is the course will finish you'll get your certification you kind of give uh, the online assessment uh, all of you will pass it's not going to be very difficult but really what i would want you to do is having done so much hard work i know that 22 out of the 35 of you are online to kind of get your accreditation now what is very important is that once you get this uh, is that you are safely implementing a lung ultrasound practice in your units and there is uh, there some important very important aspects to how you want to do that because there are medical legal implications of kind of practicing lung ultrasound after courses and it's not just this course or any anyone trying to implement point of care ultrasound after doing a face to face or online course has to have uh, you know a very safe clinical approach to be able to implement it now i'm going to give you a little bit of background about existing frameworks now my my introductory slide basically talks about the fact that you know there's been an explosion of lung ultrasound with time i think uh, there's an explosion of focus in general and if you look at point of care ultrasound as it's being performed in neonatology at this particular point we have the brain we have the heart uh, we clearly now have lung and uh, a lot of people are now also starting to learn bowel including myself uh, focus for lines and vascular access has been established for a very very long period uh, along with brain i'd say vascular access has been there and i think the the kind of approaches for us a, a lot of us has kind of been using point of care ultrasound uh, subsequent to doing x rays and i think at least in the uk the practice would still be you 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 get an x ray you get your lines but what i'd say is that if your lines are in good position either in the umbilical vessels or even for pick lines it is an absolutely beautiful uh, technique to be able to kind of look at the tip but also to be able to adjust lines but does need a significant degree of practice the important aspect of trying to introduce point of care ultrasound is that this explosion is traditionally cross specialty and cross specialty kind of means that we have people in pediatric emergency medicine who are using point of care ultrasound we have our colleagues in pediatrics who are currently using point of care ultrasound for vascular access i know in southampton where i was working our picu and pediatric colleagues would basically use an ultrasound even for normal cannulation and i know that for difficult pick lines it's been introduced and nurse practitioners have been trained to be able to use it in southampton which is fantastic but kind of early steps and in inroads into the neonatal unit are also making uh, rapid advances and the challenge with that is obviously we have to have evidence that it's good for practice and clearly we have international evidence which kind of looks at uh, the use of point of care ultrasound so i mean to give you a flavor point of care ultrasound for the use of and diagnosis of pneumothorax uh, kind of has level b evidence as per the elco guidelines i think when they're revised and the new guidance comes up there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that will change to level a and uh, clearly i think you know the diagnosis and management of both ultrasound and pleural effusion will move forwards in a significant way when subsequent guidelines are actually proposed there's also frameworks for how you want to introduce this into practice for credentialing that we're going to talk about today but along with the significant growth in our use of point of care ultrasound we have to understand there are some limitations and i i can't emphasize that enough in that a we're not radiologists we're certainly not pediatric radiologists and if you look at the domain of performing ultrasound in 
uh, both the pediatric and the neonatal age group. Uh, we know that uh, pediatric radiologists have far more extensive training as compared to us. You know, they, they, they go through a structured training program, which in the UK is about five to seven years. They specialize in pediatrics, you know, over a period of two or three years. And if you look at the length and breadth of that training as compared to the training that we're doing, I mean, we're learning lung ultrasound over a period of just six months. And then the expectation is that we'll have enough to be able to put this into practice. And some of our radiologists would actually argue that they've spent years trying to get this training. And uh, we're trying to do this with a much shorter duration of training, uh, having kind of attended an online course and done practice on the unit and some peer review. Well, who's to say that's enough? I think the other aspect, uh, our use of ultrasound, and this is the most important thing that I want to emphasize to you today, is that when we're using ultrasound, we're basically using and targeting specific organ systems. We're looking at the brain, we're looking at the lungs, we're looking at the heart, and what we're trying to do is answer very specific questions. Now, that's quite crucial. And the reason I say that is when you look at point of care ultrasound for say cardiac assessment and functional neonatal echocardiography, if you have not, and you're not doing structural echocardiography, there's a very, very big risk in that situation that you might be doing an ultrasound or an echo, which basically picks up a structural problem where you're trying to focus on, say, a functional aspect of assessment. And the same problem can occur with lung ultrasound as well, in that you may well have a lung malformation, which is not easily diagnosed by lung ultrasound, but which for which we don't actually have the experience for diagnosis, which actually needs a CT scan, which confounds our interpretation of a particular scan image. Now, we're not trained, we're not competent to be able to uh, kind of identify that aspect, but really it may confound our interpretation of what we're seeing in a baby who might have congenital cystic adrenomatoid malformation. Again, how many cases of diaphragmatic hernia do you have to see to be able to be confident that you're making a diagnosis of a you know, congenital diaphragmatic hernia using lung ultrasound? I think clearly from our perspective, what we have to do is work within our limitations. And what we're trying to do is do a focused ultrasound to answer a specific question, as opposed to diagnosing those broader things. But then that brings in the risk that we might miss something. I think you also have is a lack of training standards. Now, I think for point of care neonatal echocardiography, there's a lot of work which has been done with you know the the the, the guidelines produced by Afif uh, Kufash and his group on uh, you know TN echo functional echocardiography. It is a very comprehensive, extensive, uh, you know, group of core competencies that it will take years to achieve. And I think I worry a little bit about whether it's actually feasible to achieve all the competencies as outlined in that document. But when you look at lung ultrasound, we don't have anybody who's actually defined a formal curriculum based document that kind of says, we need a certain number of scans to achieve certain levels of competencies. We certainly have no evidence of the learning curve. And we've got a variety of settings in which we're trying to implement this. We've got busy level three and level two units. We have level one units where you can have babies who pitch up, where getting radiology can be extremely difficult. Now, using a lung ultrasound or an ultrasound machine to diagnose an pneumothorax might be hugely beneficial. But the problem is when you try to get training, how many pneumothraces are you going to get over a period of an year to kind of say that you're now competent enough to be able to diagnose it? And you can see some of the pitfalls that we discussed with the diagnosis of a pneumothorax in the images that we saw today with Doris. So we don't actually have any defined evidence for how many scans we should be performing, how frequently we should be performing those scans to be able to recognize normal and abnormal pathology in the lung. But more importantly, how frequently will we get the clinical material to be able to maintain those training standards going forwards? Uh, what we are doing is we, we are using ultrasound, point of care ultrasound in our practice through courses that are being run face-to-face -face online. But again, if you look at the courses that I know so far, I don't know any courses that formally accredit skills uh, that come to your institute, uh, you know, where you have master trainers who will be able to hold your hand and actually guide you through the process. Most face-to-face -face courses will kind of be organized with a view to trying to get you to pursue uh, the training locally under the supervision of somebody who's either already had the training or under the supervision of your pediatric cardiologist or pediatric radiologist. Now, there's a big problem with lung ultrasound in that not a lot of pediatric radiologists are trained in point-of-care lung ultrasound. 
So how do we then take something that we've learned and integrate it into practice safely? Now, there are concerns that I've just shared with you, but there are concerns that are actually expressed by uh, working groups, international working groups. And these are some of the aspects that uh, an article that I will share with you today have been uh, written about by the European Society of Pediatric Radiology in 2021. I think there are major areas of anxiety is that we might be implementing point of care ultrasound, new diagnostic methodologies based on that without adequate supervision, without adequate rigor and without clear standards. I think that comes from the fact that they go through a very rigorous training program to be able to achieve similar competencies. The question then is one where you need institutional credentialing and ongoing training standards. And a radiologist would have a certain number of their scans peer reviewed every year to kind of ensure that they're maintaining their credentialing and competencies. But reporting in the UK, say, for example, by a, a pediatric radiologist would ensure that they've gone through and had a certificate of completion of training, which is training over five to seven years with further super specialization, maybe included of two years or three years, which basically focuses on pediatric radiology, which covers all the systems. Now, at the moment, we do not have any standards for credentialing of lung ultrasound in particular, which say that we attend a course, we do a certain number of images, we keep a log of them, and we present them to our institute and kind of say, well, I'm good enough to start performing lung ultrasound now. Uh, can I start doing it? And really, what, what I would like to take you through is a safe approach today of how you might want to do that. There is always the risk that with our, even with the best of our skills, we, we might practice, we might do a thousand scans, but we might miss a diagnosis, which results in delayed treatment. And I think the radiologists have a lot of worry that the implementation of point of care ultrasound without adequate training, without adequate credentialing, and without the implementation of guidelines and protocols may result in an increased risk of misdiagnosis, which then costs the patient. Uh, but more importantly, from our perspective, results in a poor outcome. And that's not good. There are obviously risks of costs and litigation, and then there's the question of how we quality assure. So, you know, you will learn lung ultrasound, you'll practice, you'll have your log books, you'll get your certification. But really, who's going to peer review your scans locally if you don't have another member of your team who's not learned or a pediatric radiologist who's got adequate experience to be able to review those scans? And what if you make a mistake? What then happens? We're, we're all liable to making mistakes. What is the governance framework around that? And you know, this article covers these aspects, which are very important in my mind very, very well. One of the most important concerns is the fact that we might be performing point of care ultrasound or lung ultrasound without the oversight of a radiologist. So if you find something that you can't explain on the ultrasound that you're doing and you want uh, a radiologist to support you, they, they might not have trained in that modality enough to be able to comment on those images. Alternatively, you might not have a 24 seven pediatric or adult radiologist who can actually come and uh, hold your hand. What, what do you do about making treatment decisions in those circumstances? In low resource settings, I mean, I've just finished a study with Dr. Suryavanshi and uh, we, we've basically done an, a kind of a survey of about a hundred colleagues who've been learning point of care ultrasound uh, over the past three years. And 50% of those colleagues do not have access to a pediatric or an adult radiologist to be able to give them advice regarding their scans. So, you know, there are major radiology concerns, at least in Europe, that if there's a lack of oversight, there's a higher risk that we'll be implementing training in point of care ultrasound without adequate supervision and without adequate quality assurance, but without the ability to be able to refer to experts if we run into trouble. Now, they, the European Society of Pediatric Radiology does endorse that the fact that they have these concerns does not mean that we should not be learning, that we should not be uh, performing point of care ultrasound because there are clear advantages and that a point of care ultrasound for the diagnosis of a bedside clinical condition or syndrome or a group of symptoms gives you a very rapid diagnosis that can influence your treatment and management. And you might not have the ability to have a radiologist who can come and review those images or those scans 
at that particular point of time now what do you do do you let the baby come to harm uh a very good example is diagnosis of nec where you know we we sometimes have x rays which have pneumatosis that we've thought of that we're looking at which are kind of diagnosed by a pediatric radiologist 6 days down the line because that's the timeline for their reporting we sometimes have real confusion with whether there's free air in the abdomen with very small amounts where you know we have to do decubitus views no we might not have an available pediatric ray or an adult radiologist to come and help us interpret those uh, those x rays and we really have to do that based on our clinical judgment our assessment of the baby bedside but more importantly using a great uh, an important tool of clinical correlation looking at the baby which the radiologist does not have so there's no doubt that i think they also accept that point of care ultrasound will be implemented has to be implemented but the question is how you do it and how you do it safely and they've proposed certain standards and again i'll share this article with you today and that they would like the education to be done in a very standard structured way very similar to the way radiologists uh, have their training because they want us to achieve a similar level and standard uh, to them but more importantly uh, those training standards need to have a uh, an approach of credentialing or what we call privileging over here which says well you've had the education it's been verified by somebody by an authority in your local institute who then provides you the appropriate credentials to perform this ultrasound in this particular organ now it may say your institute might decide that you have enough experience to do that independently or your institute might decide that they don't want to take the medical legal risks of you doing it independently that you do it and that it is supervised by a pediatric radiologist if they are available so you can discuss those images and certainly in our setup for our echoes uh, i would say that the safest thing from our perspective is for us to discuss it with the pediatric cardiology team and they can actually review those images 24/7 because we can upload them to the system and that is the approach that we take now we don't have anybody like that for lung ultrasound uh none of our pediatric radiologists are trained in it so again how do we establish that we'll talk about that today but more importantly once you've had your training and your credentialing how are you going to implement this safely you know what are the guidelines and indications to perform the lung ultrasound uh what are the reporting standards how are you going to store the images if you need them for peer review or medical legal purposes now these standards are well defined in this paper the problem is they don't address certain other things so first of all they don't address what we do if we make a mistake now what if you do think there is a pneumothorax in a baby who's acutely deteriorating who's giving you signs and symptoms of shock with sats of 50 and a dropping heart rate and uh, you do needle the baby and actually clinically this baby has symptoms but does not have a pneumothorax and you create a pneumothorax well that is an area where you know that mistake can happen even with a chest x ray where some people sometimes get confused with skin folds and the absence of of kind of you know uh, lung markings now clearly those are babies who often don't have much respiratory distress so what you do is you clinically correlate and again what i'd be saying is that with lung ultrasound or any kind of point of care ultrasound clinically correlating becomes very important but there has to be uh a governance and risk based approach which kind of says that if you make a mistake with any diagnostic modality in the saved images which may be retrospectively reviewed by maybe somebody else a peer or an expert in that group who then questions that diagnosis is how you then address that uh, what is the duty of candor around that how you address that with the parents and how you address level of risk and level of harm because we are all you know at risk of making mistakes uh, we're human uh as you can see there are pitfalls with how you introduce any diagnostic modality and then the last thing is oversight i mean oversight basically uh kind of for me means who eventually is responsible for the reporting uh the diagnosis the reporting and uh, you know the treatment decisions based on their lung ultrasounds uh is it you uh how do you minimize this risk and this is very very important from a medical legal perspective with regards to training clearly again what is the length and duration of training that we need to have to be able to safely say well we performed a certain number of scans over this amount of period so that provides us with the appropriate amount of credentialing to be able to do lung ultrasound but then the question is how many scans do we need to keep performing 
to be able to keep those competencies to allow further progression? And what and how do we train when lung ultrasound or any point of care ultrasound methodology makes advances? Now, we're clearly seen with function echocardiography, we've come to the point where we're now doing TDI. Uh, you know, th th there's a huge amount of progress that's been made with, you know, dynamic uh, kind of functional echocardiography, which obviously a huge number of us are not practicing because we're not trained. How do we get that training? And clearly the way I, I look at point of care ultrasound is I think there will be significant advances in time, which kind of means, well, how do you get that training safely and how do you implement it in your unit? So you have to consider all of these things. And some of the documents don't kind of describe that in enough detail for neonates to be able to say, this is exactly how and what we should be doing. There's just the evidence isn't out there. In terms of education standards, I mean, the European Society of Pediatric Radiology says that uh, our focus should not just be certification. It should not just be learning a technique. There should be a clear focus on why we're doing a particular point of care ultrasound, the indications, what kind of questions we're hoping to answer from it, and in particular, a huge amount of clinical correlation uh, and education uh, standard that actually establishes this in, in the form of formal guidance is very important. So I know for a fact that when I wrote the guideline for Southampton, we agreed that we would not be using lung ultrasound scores for the purpose of diagnosis and management of RDS. And the reason for that is we electively intubate a lot of our babies under 26 weeks. We have a high PEEP failure rate. And for that reason, you know, if you're already going to give them surfactant and the evidence is not out there for the second dose, and that we don't have high quality evidence to guide us about that, the question is, why would you then use lung ultrasound scores in that context? So a significant aspect of the kind of education standards that you have to kind of uh, invoke uh, is making sure that you're implementing guidance and you're doing the education around that. Now, it is the feeling of the European Society of Pediatric Research that they should be involved in those discussions. And the importance around that is when you're producing guidelines is speaking to your local radiology team, not just about storage and reporting, but also about uh, some of the aspects of how you're going to implement this practice in institutes where it's not being used. The second aspect of the educational standard is, and this is very important for you as teams who want to take lung ultrasound forward in your respective institutes, you might want to in due course become master trainers you might want to get other colleagues to learn lung ultrasound or point of care ultrasound and practice it as a group. Now, what and how should, should we be learning? What are the minimum standards? Now, the European Society of Pediatric Research basically says, well, learning could be classroom-based, didactic face-to-face, -face, online learning followed by hands-on training. Uh, it could be didactic face-to-face, learn through simulated modeling. And we have a lot of phantoms that we've, we're currently producing to be able to kind of simulate lung ultrasound. We have really nice models that are being produced by BabyWorks, which actually allow you to practice on those models. And you follow that up with hands-on training in your institute under peer supervision of a colleague, maybe some of you in the future, once you had adequate credentialing as agreed by your institution. And then there are people who would obviously want to attend dedicated fellowship programs. But these are kind of the, the educational modalities that are there in practice at the moment that you'll find are available globally. There is a major criticism in that, how do we, how do we credential people? And a, a key criticism that I have faced is, well, I'm mentoring about 22 out of 35 of you through this particular process. What is the guarantee that I know that it's you who's doing the scan. And my simple answer to the colleagues who raised that criticism is, well, when you do a face-to-face -face course, you expect that person to go back and learn and implement that in practice. How do you follow that up? Are you holding the hands at that particular point of time? Are they coming back to you to show you a log of images? How are you verifying those competencies? Eventually, uh, the lack of credentialing through education standards has to be addressed through what I call is formal accreditation. And how you do that is, is through practice in your local institute in the majority of cases, which is done under some form of peer supervision, which might be in the institute. And a good example of a practice that has been uh, there for a very long time is people who go for EACVI accreditation for point of care 
pediatric uh, kind of cardiology, that is mainly structural. Uh, it doesn't have much of a functional aspect to it, but they will do a hundred scans in the first year, give an exam and then give, do a hundred echoes in the second year to do 250 echoes approximately, which are kind of signed off by a master trainer who sends those images to the EACVI, which then assesses them and kind of says, well, you've achieved these level of competencies as signed off by your master trainer. We're happy to provide you with certification. Now, again, the question I ask you for the people who say, how do you verify that those people are doing the scans? At the end of the day, there's no easy way. And I think we have to be sensible in how we approach this and that there has to be an element of trust in this. There is no system that's going to be perfect. So eventually credentialing has to be decided by your local institution. And what I'd say is you need to have guidelines. But for the way it's done over the world, the majority of people who kind of train at this particular point do courses and give exams. And at least in the adults, uh, what I know is there's pre and post test kind of tests of knowledge, which basically help to validate your theoretical competencies. The, the, I don't know of any exams that at least in the pediatric or the neonatal group kind of verify practical competencies so far. Uh, there are obviously competency-based fellowship programs. Now, I think it's easy for us to talk about them, but we have to realize that we there are people who are established clinicians and really those established clinicians also have to learn and they can't just drop their job and go and apply and do a six or 12 month fellowship program to learn lung ultrasound to then come back and get credentialed in their unit. Uh, it's it it's it's a uh, limited places that are available in Canada, the states, uh, or what I'd say is it's big institutes like in Paris who are implementing this and training their fellows as cohorts. It's part of the the neonatal curriculum in 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 Paris, but unfortunately, if you look at the whole of the UK, point of care ultrasound per se is not part of either the neonatal or the pediatric curriculum as I know it at this particular point as a defined competency, which says you have these 25 competencies, we want you to do 200 scans. And then actually once we've reviewed them, we can accredit you. Nothing like that exists. There's the concept of the master trainer and a master trainer is like what we're doing at the moment and that we have six trainers who are peer reviewing your images, which you're sharing online or in person. You could have a master trainer in your local institute. Uh, and then there are formal bodies and institutional accreditation, as is done through the Australian Society of Ultrasound Medicine, as is done through the POCUS Neonatal Group in Canada, who do an absolutely fantastic piece of work. Uh, they've also started a mentoring course and they, 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 they take you through online mentoring. Uh, and then you have formal radiology programs where you can apply to practice and learn, I would say mainly bowel related ultrasound as part of a formal radiology program I'm not aware that there are formal radiology programs on lung. Uh, we, we, we all know they're formal functional eco programs, but your credentialing will be based on you having done some form of training through a structure that involves a model which has didactic face-to-face -face online learning with peer review and practical training followed by some form of certification. And that certification then for the purposes of credentialing has to be recognized by your institute for you to be able to safely practice. How rigorous has this got to be? How long has this got to be for us to be as good as a pediatric radiologist for bowel ultrasound or for cranial ultrasound? How many images do we have to do? For cranial ultrasound, there's definitely, uh, I'd say a lot of publish, published work. I'd say for echocardiography, there's a lot of published work, but for lung and bowel, there's, there's nothing at the moment. There's one article for bowel, which has only recently been published by Pradeep Suryavanshi and his group. And for lung, uh, there is one article which has recently been published by uh, Mahmood and Anna Milan, which again, doesn't talk about really the curriculum, the length of training and what, what actual skills and competencies we need for credentialing. More importantly, there's absolutely nothing about what we should be doing in the Institute to keep our recredentialing and, and our privileging. And with that comes a very important aspect. I don't think we can, we can train to the level of a pediatric radiologist to have those expectations to be able to learn point of care ultrasound. And the reason for that is that length might not be achievable practically 
it might be too long. And certainly for people who are established clinicians who are working in their current kind of jobs, getting that kind of training is, is, is just not practically feasible. Uh, there are not enough placements in the UK, there are not enough placements in Canada for their own trainees. There are not enough radiology trainers. So if they can't train them, their own trainees, uh, how, how can we expect to be trained? Now, my worry is that you can't then come and say that we should not do this or we should not learn how to do this, or we should not try to develop some guidance around how to do this, because there's a real real benefit in, in performing point of queer ultrasound that we've spoken about already. I think what we have to do is agree that there are certain, I would say, in a way, differences between how we will be performing it versus the radiologist that we need to reconcile with each other. And the reason I'm presenting this is because if you're implementing this in your local institute, I would say that if you've not spoken to the radiologists, then you're missing out. And the reason you're missing out is because there are certain conditions of the lung that need further imaging, that might need refill. There are clearly situations where we will, we will find something that we can't recognize. And actually having that overview or oversight, and I would say that ability for them to be able to come back and say, look, I've had a look at it as well, and I don't know what it is. Let's get a CT or let's, or I've done a chest X-ray and a lung ultrasound, and I don't know what it is. Having that communication basically medically legally for you keeps you safe. And the one thing that I want to emphasize, you know, as part of this is I, I often get asked a lot of questions by, by different trainees and colleagues, you know, they'll call me up at three o'clock in the night. And sometimes I kind of feel that the reason they're asking me that question is because they want to write in the notes, discuss with Dr. Sharma, plan action. You know, it, it feels like kind of, you could have made that decision yourself. You're firing a bullet over my shoulder. You just want me to give the go ahead. Actually, I would not want my pediatric radiologist to feel that way. Sorry. So I think what is really important is that when you're performing lung-based ultrasound, you're doing it to answer a focused clinical question. You're doing it to kind of guide you with regards to a particular intervention in real time. And, you know, that might be a, a pleural effusion that needs tapping. And a, a good example for me is I, I do not tap pleural effusions without having done a lung ultrasound, if practically possible. Uh, you, you often know that we go into the triangle of safety between the third to fifth space. Well, if I can do a lung ultrasound, which shows the maximum pocket is actually in the sixth space, and the level is well below that, and I want to go into the posterior axillary line, I can mark that out. And that's actually the point at which I want to go. So it's something that is going to aid my practice that I can learn how to do. I think the question from my perspective is uh, it makes things much safer and it might trigger uh, safety as well as immediate therapy, which is the right thing for that particular baby. I might not have a pediatric radiologist to come and do the ultrasound, which I did have in Southampton, and which some of my pediatric radiology colleagues would resent. They would hate having to come in to mark a particular point for us to do the ultrasound, and they might not be available. Now, clearly in those situations, if I'm trained and I can do it, why not? Similarly, if I, if I have a radiologist or a radiographer who's 30 minutes away, who's off site, and it's gonna take me 30 minutes to get an X-ray to decide whether this baby has an pneumothorax or not, point of care ultrasound will help me in those circumstances. And it might be hugely beneficial because this child might deteriorate. So clearly there is a role for it. And there is a way that we have to train for it to ensure that we're doing it safely. But more importantly, we're doing it and not treading on the toes of our, our, our radiology colleagues. I think what we have to achieve is a middle ground. We have to have a pathway for credentialing us and the European Society of Pediatric Radiologists does not like to call us neonatal focus experts. They like to call us non-radiologists who want to perform neonatal point of care ultrasound. And I think that's a fair, you know, it's a fair generalization. Uh, I think what we all agree, including them, as well as publications by the Hispanic Working Group, a uh, very nice article on, uh, you know, the risks of performing point of care ultrasound, even with training that I will send to you, is that we need a minimum standard that is acceptable cross specialty. And this will vary from country to country. I know that in the Australian Society of Kind of Ultrasound Medicine, they're quite happy for us to do about 25 lung ultrasounds to kind of start 
and then do a further 25 to kind of credential into advanced lung ultrasound, which is 50 lung ultrasounds without specifying a period over which it's done. But they, they, they kind of feel that six months to an year is good enough time to be able to achieve that. So you do a face-to-face -face course, you do those lung ultrasounds, they're reviewed by a master trainer, they're signed off, you keep a logbook, and actually you're good to go in terms of performing point of care lung ultrasound. That would be their accreditation, which is then acceptable to the Australian Society of Radiology, which kind of has been agreed as a standard. Unfortunately, for the UK, there is no such standard. I don't know that there is such a standard for uh, the US. I know for the Canadians, they're negotiating such a standard. And I know that in Paris, uh, you know, with Nadia and our group, point of care ultrasound is basically done in the baby's best interests. So I have a question. So Anna, basically, Anna, just a statement. She's saying, my pediatric radiologists don't believe in lung ultrasound. So, you know, there it is. Uh, how do we achieve this balance? Well, there are proposed frameworks. There weren't frameworks previously. Anna, do you want to come in there? Do you want to say something? No, Alok. No, no. Okay. Uh, just, again, what I'd say is that this is one framework which is practiced in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which basically says that for the purposes of education, you can do a two-day introductory focus course. You can have didactic training with a little bit of simulation. You can have some hands-on and some live models, which is something that we're doing in the UK at the moment with our face-to-face -face course. We're doing it in Wales. We've done it in Wessex. We're hoping to kind of visit regions, but the idea is we would go to you. We'd provide you the theoretical and the simulation-based education on day one. And on day two, we'd actually go to your institute, use your machine on babies who are well, maybe some who have a pathology but are not sick and unwell and likely to have any detriment to their clinical status pass, teaching with parental permission to be able to show you how to do lung ultrasound, but more importantly, use your machine for the purposes of image acquisition storage and image optimization. I, I can't emphasize how that's something that I really, I, I feel bad about when I'm teaching you online because I, I can't be there with you to kind of show you how best to optimize your machine. And we've done it online for a few of our colleagues, uh, not online, actually over the phone. And it's, it's, it's okay, but it would be so much better if we could do it in person. But more importantly, what they then expect is that you have a clinical workflow and a patient assessment tool, which basically standardizes how you're going to perform lung ultrasound. What basically patient assessment here means is that you have a guideline which basically standardizes how you're going to do it, how you're going to interpret normal versus abnormal, and then really how you're going to report, uh, how you're going to kind of do normology, improve your images, uh, keep a record, have a clinical workflow in place. And once that's done, really, you go through a period of experiential training with this clinical workflow, which they haven't defined. They, you know, the, This article, which is published by the AAP, doesn't really define the number of scans. But after the experiential learning, you implement in clinical practice all of this. And really, you have a, a process with your institute that kind of agrees, well, you've done the training. This is what we've seen. We grant you privileges to be able to continue performing lung ultrasound. What we want you to do is have some, some, some process to kind of report, peer review, and quality assure. And really, this is just the same slide. I'm going to skip it. But really, what are we doing as part of this course? How are we trying to formalize your experience? So we've had the didactic learning through kind of some of the talks that we've given. We also have the theoretical learning for you to go through on the, you know, the, the, the web portal, which is there with you for life. As it keeps getting added to, you, you can access it. That means that if there are new modalities added to it, you can keep accessing them. But Really what we've done is defined a, a curriculum that we want you to achieve, which takes you through the normal versus the abnormal lung, diagnosis of pathology, in the context of clinical correlation, whilst you're performing lung ultrasound side by side. You, you basically perform five which recognizes normal. And really what we're doing now is we're formalizing through the OSAL tool your abnormal and clinical correlation. So you've done a lot of that already, which I've signed off in your logbooks. But more importantly, the OSAL assessments are merely formalizing this now as practically done as well. 
And then really what we'll do is assess your knowledge in clinical correlation through an online MCQ. And the expectation from our perspective is by the end of this course, if you've done anywhere up to, I'd say, 15 lung ultrasounds, you've, you've kind of achieved, I would say, uh, a degree of training under supervision. The idea is you will take that forwards in your own institutes. And once you kind of reach a level of having done 50 scans, and you have to determine how you're going to take that forwards. Is there more than one of you training? Are you going to have a group of people? Are you going to have a group of maybe yourselves in the UK who might want to, or in Portugal, who might want to come together and kind of say, well, we want to create a group of peer reviewers who are going to discuss scans, online peer review each other's scans to be able to kind of achieve those competencies. But really your implementation at level four would also include the development of guidelines, uh, implementation, and really continuing practice in your place of work. How would you approach that? Well, as a bare minimum, and I know that some of you have already done that. I know that Anna's prepared a guideline. I know that uh, Nas and Sankar are preparing a guideline as we speak. I know that me and Leila are doing the guideline along with uh, Galia and uh, Dr. Khan in uh, the Corniche. So really what we're doing is we're developing a guideline which clearly outlines the diagnostic criteria for normal versus abnormal, which pathologies we want to identify. We're not going to be experts in the diagnosis of congenital diaphragmatic hernia for yonks. I mean, absolutely no doubt we're going to get an x-ray done. We're, we're going to talk to our surgeons. So really that might not be part of our guideline to start off with. The diagnosis of common things like pneumothorax, pneumonia, meconium aspiration, differentiating RDS from TTN, the bread and butter stuff, you know, would be something that could easily be defined and which all of you have demonstrated good skills in. But more importantly, what we have to define after that is how are we going to store images for peer review, for medical legal review, for review if we make a mistake, how we standardize report those images, and then what and how we treat based on that. And a, a good example is, at, at least in my setup, uh, we, we haven't formally introduced lung ultrasound, but there's no doubt in my mind in a baby who's completely stable, where a lung ultrasound confirms a pneumothorax, absolutely no doubt we'd be recommending as part of our guideline that that baby has a chest X-ray, proper clinical assessment before and after, and that we, we do that even though we're doing the lung ultrasound. I know that in Paris, they're quite happy. They don't do X-rays at all. and you know, that's the confidence. I think the challenge also is not all of us will be performing lung ultrasound. Some of us will need x-rays. And I think it's really important that we reassure colleagues who are not doing it, that actually their approach is as safe as ours in those circumstances. You know, for attention to the racks where a baby's deteriorating, it's a clinical diagnosis. You make a clinical diagnosis, you transluminate. And if it's attention to the racks, you do a needle thoracentesis. You might not even have time to do a lung ultrasound. So again, you need to have all of this outlined in your guideline once you start practicing. What is also very important is that you have formal guidance for how you're going to assess the training of people who are learning and coming and wanting to perform lung ultrasound on your unit. I mean, some of them might have be experts like Nadia who moved to a different hospital and they would practice under what we call as the grandfather clause, which kind of means they have already trained. They have got evidence of their training They've got evidence of, uh, you know, their logs, uh, their their publications, everything, which kind of means that really a formal assessment of their competencies might not be necessary. Uh, there might be people who then want to train and then come in where you have to have some way of being able to formally assess their skills and training as they gain those competencies, very similar to what we're doing over here. And then you have to have what is an overall uh, kind of overview of how you credential these individuals. And that credentialing basically means that they come with their experience. Well, when I when I joined the Corniche, there was a, a sign off for even my cranial ultrasounds and my echoes kind of say that these have been peer reviewed in a forum and been peer reviewed by a colleague, a peer of my expertise to kind of say that I've met that minimum standard. And I think that's a really, really good practice. I think that's really good because we all come with certain differences in the way we train and differences in how we report. And this is really important because when you're developing guidance for lung ultrasound, the way it works best is if you are using the same standards of diagnosis of pathology, the same descriptors, similar methods of reporting, using 
how you implement your your probes, the frequencies, you know, a very important aspect is if I'm using a high frequency to look at a small preterm baby and a colleague of mine then uses a different probe, you might have completely different interpretations. So it's really important for you to have credentialing and privileging kind of definitions. And then the question is how you maintain that. Now, I know that in the UK, once you have it, you've got it for life. I think the expectation under the grandfather clause is that you're doing it. Uh, I, I'll come back to the question that Naz has asked just after this, but really what, what, what we're expected to do at least uh, over here is have a certain number of our scans peer reviewed and quality assured. And I know that 10% of the cranial ultrasounds that we perform annually are peer reviewed and quality assured by another colleague. And it just means that, uh, you know, if I get the labeling wrong the odd time and somebody comes and taps me on the shoulder and kind of says, look, this could become a governance issue, you might end up with the wrong side kind of situation. That's a really good way for me to make sure my practice is still safe. On the other hand, if I'm starting to see a deterioration in the machine because the probe has dropped a lot and the image quality is deteriorating for all of us, then really we might have machine aspects that then need to be addressed. What is very, very important is that uh, for institutes who don't have adult and pediatric radiologists, you have some form of internal peer review. And that is important both when you're doing the scan, but also once you've done a scan and you report it. And a, a good example of very good practices, a peer review once a month that we used to do in Leicester for the echoes, where we'd all come together as colleagues, the colleagues who do echocardiography, review our echoes and give a small critique on what we could have done better. And this was never about finding mistakes and finding fault. This was really about, actually, this looks beautiful. The scan looks okay. Is this, this is something that I've done slightly differently. I don't know whether you do it or not. And really, there was a lot of cross-learning uh, through those kind of peer review approaches. Expert peer review could be through a pediatric radiologist if they know lung ultrasound. It might be the two of you are learning, like Naz and Shankar are, and you have a two-person approach, which kind of means that you both have credentials and you both can critique each other's scans and peer review them. But more importantly, if you're in a bind and you don't know what something might look like and you need to make a treatment decision and that person's there, they can actually come and have a look at it. And that's called peer kind of assessment. And that you, you're following a two-person approach to make a diagnostic kind of... Uh, uh, clinical judgment about whether you need to treat or not. And I find that really, really helpful. Again, I've talked about the grandfather clause. We've talked about quality assurance, but what is very important when you're trying to implement lung ultrasound in your, your NICU is what happens if you make a mistake? What happens if you have and think that there is a, a mnemonic consolidation versus uh, an atelectasis and really you don't uh, clinically correlate and you don't start antibiotics and delay. And actually you don't do a chest X-ray. And when you look at the chest X-ray, I mean, it's very obvious. You've got what looks like a patchy mnemonic consolidation, which your lung ultrasound didn't quite diagnose, maybe because you didn't do the posterior regions. And again, what, what is very important is it's, it's comprehensive scans were clinically indicated. So you need to have a governance framework for addressing this, which kind of says that this is the approach we're going to take. This is how we, we're going to look at it. In most institutes where I have practiced, this is a non-punitive approach that follows a risk-based strategy. That means you have duty of candor with the parents. You explain why you might and why that might've happened. And we all know that you know mistakes could be there because of the machine, of the probes. It could be that we had limitations to how we were performing the scan. This baby wasn't stable enough. You could not do the posterior regions. You had to go and ventilate this baby and recruit might be a human factors issue. There's a delay in the antibiotics coming up. And that really has to be addressed through risk in a non-punitive way, which aids your learning. And I know that in some parts of the world that just doesn't work. But I think if you practice this approach, what you are doing by doing all of this is reducing your risk of a medical legal complication from happening. I'm not saying that the approach has to be as rigorous as this. I'm not saying that you have to stick to all of this to be able to implement it because I know that it's it's not feasible in certain places. It's not feasible in low resource settings. And I, I know that we do not have pediatric radiologists uh, you know, in every hospital, even level three centers and point of care ultrasound, including lung ultrasound would be hugely beneficial. But 
maybe risk and governance can then address that and say that we don't have that. And really what we will be following is a quorum approach where I'll be discussing with a colleague. Or if I don't have a colleague, really, I'll be making a clinical judgment based on clinical correlation at that particular point of a time, just like I would do with a chest X-ray. And we sometimes get it wrong with chest X-rays. And who's to say that we're always clinically right? So medicine practices within certain norms of, you know, diagnosis. We, we can't always get it right. At a particular point of time, the baby might have symptoms that change. And really, if you change your decision based on that, the fact that you've had a delay in diagnosis might be there because that's the natural course of what we're seeing. So it might not be that you've made a mistake, but by having it outlined in a risk and governance structure, it just means that you can address that in a safe and a non-punitive way if you have it. It also means that if you decide to discuss this with a radiologist or this goes to an external peer review, and I'm not talking about lung ultrasound, some echoes can get reviewed. When you're doing diagnostic point of care ultrasound, and you're focusing on a particular aspect of the heart and you miss a pericardial effusion because you've never diagnosed it, and that goes for peer review, then if your governance addresses that actually you're performing a targeted neonatal echo for that particular question to answer that, and you're not skilled in the diagnosis of a pericardial effusion because the line's in the wrong place, that's what then protects you. Any questions so far? Just because I'm coming to the end of the talk. Any questions? Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna carry on. So that brings me to the last session, last bit of the talk. We're nearly finished and well in time, it's nine. So what are the medical legal risks of performing lung ultrasound? Well, what I'd say is that if you have a guideline which outlines the indications, the diagnostic criteria, how you're going to address treatment based on what you do, with the ability to have some element of peer review and some element of quality assurance and you address risk, you actually mitigate medical legal complications in a very, very big way. Now, there is a lovely paper which has been published by Mirza, which basically looks at the barriers to introduction of point of care ultrasound in neonatal ICUs. And medical legal concerns are listed as one of the three top barriers in adopting clinical practice. And the reason for that is obviously everybody's worried about how things might be perceived when they're learning. Well, if I start learning lung ultrasound or point of care ultrasound on a baby in my unit, what if I miss something? What are the medical legal consequences of that happening? Well, what I would say is that if you've gone through a framework which addresses this already, you've mitigated this to a significant degree. What is reassuring is that there are is only one article which looks at point of care ultrasounds as performed by neonatologists or pediatric subspecialists. Now, this looked at a large number of cases, about 416 kind of uh, cases over a period of you know, 25 years. And really what they found was that none of the cases which were looked at as part of this litigation were related to either performing the lung the, the point of care ultrasound or the interpretation of the images. Rather, the only cases which were two in number that went on to kind of meet uh, a criteria for significant medical legal risk and litigation were actually related to the non-performance of a point of care ultrasound in a baby where this could have been done and made a difference. So there's no evidence over there to kind of say that whilst we're learning point of care ultrasound in the States and Canada, in the UK, in Paris, or in France, that there are very big cases of medical legal risk that have gone and created a lot of litigation. Uh, what is very important, however, is that we understand that when we're performing this, that we have gone through these governance aspects. And really, those governance aspects cover addressing the fact that we've trained, that we feel confident in being able to make the diagnosis of or treating a specific lung condition and that we're not practicing outside the scope of limitations. And a very important aspect is, look, if you've never seen a diaphragmatic hernia in your experiential learning process by the end of this course, at some point you might, but really the fail safe is that if you're worried, you get a chest X-ray. And really while you're learning, you're clinically correlating, 
you're learning to basically interpret those images within the limitations of the scans you're performing with those machines, understanding the limitations of the machines, and that you are making those diagnostic considerations, but where you're unsure, you're asking for help. If you don't have help and you are making decisions, then you are making them based on the clinical situation, the absence of further help, and in the child's best interests, in the best of faith. So you're doing this with your technical expertise, with the knowledge that sometimes we get these things wrong. What is important is that you are asking for trouble if you are working outside your limitations. And a very good example that I would say is try not to overinterpret. I, I think if you if you look at something that you can't recognize, you know, one of the, the terminologies I use is, well, if it, if it doesn't look like a plane, it ain't a plane. You know, seriously, I think if you look at something and you recognize and pattern recognition is very important, that's good. But if you look at something and this doesn't look like normal or doesn't look like something that you pattern recognize, bail out guys, default to what standard practice would be, get a chest X-ray, clinically correlate, ask your pediatric or adult radiologist for help if they can help you. Go to a level two or a level three if you're in a level one, you know, further that kind of uh, help approach. More importantly, what I'd say is that if you're doing any kind of ultrasound and you're not recording or storing images, you can land up in big trouble because there's nothing to then justify a record of how you made that particular diagnosis in those circumstances. Now, this is a major challenge in resource poor settings where you will not have the ability to do that. And I would say that if that is the case, please document very clearly and objectively why you're making a diagnosis. I think this is a pneumothorax on lung ultrasound because there is an absence of sliding. There uh, is a typical A dash profile. I have got a barcode side on the ultrasound and I can see a lung point. Big bold. These are the reasons. Where possible, you know, if you if you can't store the images, you can print them, keep them as part of the record. Try to do that. But if, as a bare minimum, if you're if you're documenting that I can see right-sided pneumothorax on the lung ultrasound without justifying exactly why objectively, you 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 may land up into trouble. I'd also say that if you're training with equipment that's poor, inadequate, you know, you've got a probe that's ten years old, that's fallen down, that's not giving you adequate pixelation, or you're training with the wrong settings. Again, what I'd say is just be very, very careful. Again, I would I would say that if you're using probes that are curvilinear, you're looking for lung sliding. You're looking for an A-dash profile. You're describing those objective parameters. It's absolutely crucial. In order to prevent errors in diagnosis, my, my dictum is prevention is better than cure. Competence over credentials. So simple, simple thing from my perspective is it doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter how many certificates you have. It doesn't matter how many courses you've done. I think if you've not trained to develop those competencies, really you're doing yourself a disservice because a certificate in itself and a sign off does not mean anything. I can see a person put one long line in and sign them off and it doesn't mean they can do a difficult long line which is why I would say is what is very, very important is that you work within your limitations, that if you're in doubt, you ask for help. If you have a peer, use the two-person approach. But if you're confused, just get a chest x-ray. Default to what you used to do normally. Be safe, practice safely. And again, I, I reiterate, without, without a doubt, if it doesn't look like a plane, it's not a plane. So... I've, I've talked about this. I'm, I'm going to just end by saying that, again, gain the competencies, be confident in what you do. And really, that's more important than your certification process. Again, uh, if you want to develop a lung ultrasound training program, really what you need is a core group of individuals or master trainers. And I would say that as a group, there's 22 of you out there now. There's There's eight, 10 of you in the UK who will sign off by the end of this course. You know, you guys have the potential to make this big and to develop a group who might be able to train others. I'm, I'm just holding your hand. Some of you, your skills, they're absolutely beautiful. You guys are doing very well. And I, you know, I, I just say, take it forwards. So I've got a question. I've got a few questions actually. So I've got a question from Nas. 
we do cradle ultrasound and report them, and we do not have any accreditation. Yep. Okay. Go for it, Naz. Yeah. Uh, it's just that we do so we uh, we do cradle ultrasound as a routine, and I think most of people in the UK do it as a routine um, as neonatologists. But we don't have any accreditation. We've literally done see one, do one, teach one, read about it, learn from it kind of peer reviewed with our consultants I do with Francis a lot but in the sense we've not actually we I think we have the competency but we don't have any you know accreditation and if you think on a medical legal point of view um we do it we report them it doesn't go to the radiologists how how does it fit with the rest of the things like focus and lung ultrasound is it just because it's new therefore we're looking at it differently uh, I'm going to give you three answers. The first answer is very political. The first answer is that basically our radiology colleagues go through a huge amount of training to kind of achieve similar competencies. And I think the overall feeling is we're probably not adhering to a similar curriculum and length of training to kind of achieve those competencies. My answer to them is, well, we don't have the evidence to show how many plural lines you have to see this recognize a plural line and sliding, how many kind of... Now, the challenge there is that that is the practice in the UK and that you can go through the kind of neonatal and the pediatric training program, having a kind of a master trainer who peer reviews, holds your hand for a bit, and that's acceptable. And you kind of get a CCT and a Caesar which signs you off. But actually, if you come to, or you go to Canada or the States, I think the expectation, even in Australia, so for all people performing head scans in Australia, they have to be ASIM accredited. They have to do the Australian Society of Ultrasound Medicine. What, what is really good about it is it's, it's, it's really practical. 25 head scans is good enough. So 25 head scans, which basically demonstrate a good degree of normal, abnormal, with all the kind of, I would say, pathologies. And a good example that I'd like to give you now is I think we'd all be relatively comfortable kind of doing cranial ultrasounds to make common diagnosis. But I kid you not, if you came and asked me to try and make a diagnosis of holoprosen carefully on a cranial ultrasound, which I know the experts can, I would feel a little bit uncomfortable. And again, similarly, I think if you look at trainees, making the diagnosis of a vein of Galen malformation might take a little bit of a learning curve. How many scans do we need to have be able to do to be able to kind of make that diagnosis because it's not set in stone and defined. I think the world is just a little bit more, I would say, uh, uh, a little bit more, the word I would use is pedantic about trying to make sure that we're having more formal, I would say, pathways for trying to verify these competencies. And certainly if you're moving outside the UK and you come to the Middle East, or if you go to Australia, you would need to go through that process to actually be able to perform. Uh, I don't think the UK system is wrong. That's the second question answer I'm giving you. I think the UK system is how I've trained. And I, I think I've achieved a, a reasonable degree of competence. I think I'm humble enough to kind of acknowledge I'm still learning. Uh, am I as good as Francis Cowan doing cranial ultrasounds? Probably not. And that's the challenge. We, we just haven't defined how much. I think the question from our perspective is with newer modalities like lung ultrasound and functional echo, there is more, I would say, expectation that we try and formalize these competencies before we start implementing them in practice because they result in significant clinical decision-making that you know uh, can make a significant, and you could argue the same with cranial ultrasound and IVH. Uh, I don't have an easy answer to that. I wonder what does the what does the rest of the group think? Do we need formal accreditation, or do we think? Nas, what do you think? And any answer is good. Well, I definitely think formal accreditation is really good and useful. But as you said, you also need it's it's like a DOPS. You you know you just can't do one intubation, one this, and get signed off for it. And I think that is stupid. You just need to take advantage of every. Um, moment you have to be able to do it I think and and as you said I think all of us are even with lambda sounds you do come across something new and unusual um, and different things we're now doing posterior you know fontanelle and mastoid things like yeah. that so 
that's always there. My this is that the amount of um, focus, and this is not just you are in general about you know oh you can't write that down because how can you say that, and I'm I'm not don't get me wrong I'm not no, no, absolutely. I, I, Want to do and I as you know I have been and I want to do it really well and I think it's really nice to do it in this structured way so much so I'm pestering Shankar if he can teach me how to do um you know uh, line tips and things in a similar structured way because I think that structure is really important to learn rather than just doing ad hoc but I've had comments like um the Improve Academy is not a registered academy it's not a European wild the cardiology when they do the echoes and they get a European accreditation that's official and it's European you know it's very difficult to deal with I look at it that I learning a lot from the coast and I'm getting to be competent I'm not saying I'm an expert but I think I can fairly say that I could at least diagnose a pneumothorax and basic RDS TTM that way and support the baby along with clinical it's just an add-on extra bit to the clinical it's like a crp it doesn't mean anything but if you add on clinically it means a lot that kind of thing i look at it that way but there are all these things as well in the background i think I, I, no and I, I completely respect those opinions i think for me like i said the most important aspect is your competencies uh, if you are competent at being able to do these things then actually those concerns about the medical legal aspects go down and really, that's where I would say we're working within our limitations. But at the end of it, you've got a log of all, all the images that you've done. You've got peer review that's being done by a group of individuals. You've basically gone through an assessment, which is basically using a structured observe form. And you're doing an online MCQ. And I do not know any other course globally that is trying to make this as rigorous as I can. I'm trying my best. But I completely acknowledge that none of us, are, you know, perfection is impossible to achieve. How much and how? So I'm going to ask for your help because what we are going to do at the end of this is at least the 22 of us who are doing this is we're going to study it together. I want to know what your learning curve is. And I genuinely want to know uh, how long you felt it took for you to recognize certain things because once we have that, we, we can actually then go back and say, well, this, this is self-reporting. This is self-reporting by the individuals. Now, if you do self-reporting with one group, people will say, well, that's self-reporting. But if you do self-reporting with 10 groups and they give you similar kind of observations, I think that would be hard to kind of duplicate. I think the third question to it is, it's the fact that you have evidence. And like I said, I, I mean, I've, I've applied for privileges over here. I've, I've submitted a log of everything that I've got. And that is what I'd be submitting in Canada. That's what I'd be submitting in the States. So whether somebody comes back and says, well, You've taught here, you've taught here, they're not accredited, they're accredited. It's actually the log of the images. It's the log of the fact that I've kept everything that is actually getting me formally uh, able to be able to perform these ultrasounds. And my approach with you would be, it's really that investment in keeping that, you know, that evidence. I think that's where the, the real accreditation comes from. And then being able to implement it through a, a structured guideline, I think that will keep you safe in your practice. And if you're doing it in groups, which is what people are doing, you know, uh, the Paris guys, their course is not formally accredited by anybody, but they've trained the whole of France. You know, they don't even have a spinach endorsement for it. But uh, clearly, you know, for them, uh, it's it's in the baby's best interests and they're not looking for any accreditation. So you'll find their different views. I think, I think what I'd say is respect those views and just continue working on what you want to achieve. Any other questions? Can I say something? Along? Yeah, Anna, go for it. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to say that you are doing an amazing job. Thank you. I, I think the accreditation and, and the accreditation, how many, how many people never looked to an X-ray and made a mistake? Sometimes we look at it and we don't know how to interpret it. It's normal. It's on the daily basis that happens. So I think in Portugal, things are maybe a bit easier. I think we don't have so medical legal, legal issues. I think we will have more, of course, because it's a global thing. But um, I, I'm the only one who, who does lung ultrasound in my service, so I'm a bit lonely. I, I will talk to you. 
<laughs> when I, yeah, yeah. I am and, doubt. Okay. Yeah. And that's not I, a problem. I, I'm counting on you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely and happy. Group. And on this group, because I think we can keep the peer reviewing and uh, I think we are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Okay, so guys, just one last thing before I sign off. So I will be sending you, so the end of three months, we have, as I discussed with you right at the start, we have a survey, which basically takes feedback about the course and what we can do, what is missing, what we haven't covered. I know plural effusion uh, has not been covered and I'm gonna do that next week. What I would strongly endorse is that if you haven't developed guidelines that you start working on them. I think it's really, really important. Uh, but just in terms of the study that we're doing at the moment, this is basically a study on your learning curve with regards to lung ultrasound. It's very simple, it's 20 questions. Uh, if anybody wants to kind of tag along in this work, please expressions of interest, I'm very happy to receive them. And really what I'd say is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to do the first study of trying to learn what the self-reported learning curve is with learning lung ultrasound, because I don't know that there's any literature out there. And uh, I think what is very important is that I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. Uh, you know, I, I'm really grateful for it. And just anything that we can do to make the course better, to help your learning curve, but just, uh, yeah, try to collect as many of your, if you can get five OSALs each, I'm happy to invest the time for you to get that. So there'll be a weekly peer review every Sunday. Sessions aren't gonna be this long. Uh, the pool refusion will be much shorter. And then any topics that you want to revise because the OSAL sessions will just be purely clinical review. And then any topics that you want to revise, we'll be doing the diaphragm again. And uh, anything else, just please let me know. God bless you. Thank you all. Thank you, Alok. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Alok. Thank you. Bye. God bless you.